Hey everyone, welcome to the Goody Reader Radio Show. My name is Michael and today we're going to talk about all of the Kindle news that's come out in the last couple weeks, uh, such as numerous older models not being able to access the Kindle store in August, as well as send the Kindle updates on what types of features and functionality can you do right now as well as future functionality uh, sometime in the near future as well as Kindle for Android and some big news happening with that. Of course there's been a number of big devices that have either come out or been announced so let's just get into it with some Kindle news. Probably the biggest story happening anywhere right now is the flagship Amazon Kindle app for Android from Google Play is no longer supporting the purchasing of Kindle books in the app. It was originally supposed to happen on June 1st, but it happened one day earlier. Amazon pushed out a new update version 8.58. When you open up the Kindle app, it will say that this app no longer supports a buying new content. This change is to remain in compliance with the new Google Store Play policies. Amazon is letting customers know that they can add books to their wish list. And when you buy the ebooks on an internet browser and send books directly to the Kindle app. However, if you've purchased ebooks in the past, they will continue to be accessible in your library. So this is the first time that Amazon has ever really done this for Android. They had the Kindle shopping app roughly a couple months, uh, well, might be maybe like two or three weeks ago. You can no longer buy Kindle books or Audible books in the Kindle shopping app for Android. And what is the Kindle shopping app? It's made the main app that you use to buy clothes, household goods, batteries, you know, Amazon basic stuff. Basically, if you need to buy anything from Amazon, instead of using like your PC or Mac, you can just use the, the Amazon shopping app and, you know, look at your past purchases, access tracking numbers and all that type of stuff. And Amazon disabled the purchase of digital content through there a couple weeks ago. And everyone thought that, hey, you know, they're probably not going to touch the Kindle app because it's like their flagship app. Everybody uses it on their phones and on their tablets to both buy and read content from like, you know, Kindle content. And we wrote a story and no one really believed us. I mean, all the big mainstream media picked up on it. So like everyone from like The Verge to E and Gadget, mainstream publications such as CNN, The New York Times, uh, they all picked up on it and referenced like our website and linked to it for their, all their online properties, which was kind of cool. But I mean, they do this a lot, especially because we, we break stories because our website and all of our YouTube videos and our podcasts, you know, we pretty well focus on like the digital reading industry, whether it's on e-readers or phones or tablets or on e-notes and anything like that. So this is, you know, something that we follow very, very closely. So now that the Kindle app as of June 1st, 2022, you can no longer buy eBooks through the app. Well, what can you do? Well, you can visit the Amazon website in your local market. So if you live in the UK, Amazon.co.uk. If you live in Canada, Amazon.ca. If you live in America, Amazon.com. And you know, it just goes on Italy, Australia, whatever. Uh, so you can visit the, you know, the website on your PC or Mac or using your phone's internet browser, going to Amazon, searching for a title that you want to buy, buy the Kindle edition. And then that book will be synced with, you know, the app for, you know, let's just say Kindle for Android, but it'll also be synced if you also read on your iPhone or if you have a Kindle e-reader uh, in your, you know, in your house or something like that will be sent to all your devices. So you're not exclusively reliant on just using a Kindle app. So what else can you do? Well, you could use the Samsung app store and you can download the Kindle app from there and uninstall the one that you downloaded from Google Play. The Kindle version from the, um, the Samsung App Store works and you can make purchases because everything's like handled through Amazon or for, from Samsung. 
And you could also download the Amazon App Store and download Kindle and Audible from there. And if you have that installed, Amazon handles all the billing directly, despite the fact that your phone may have Google Play on it because the Kindle app's not coming from Google Play. You will be able to easily, you know, make purchases and stuff like that because you know, the one from Samsung handled by Amazon, the one from the Amazon App Store handles from Amazon for all the billing and things like that. So if you use those apps, you're basically logging into your Amazon account using your, your login and password, the same password as you would use on the app or as on your Kindle e-reader. So all your past purchases would be accessible because it's a Kindle app. So, I mean, everything will be sunk to that app so you're not losing out on anything if anything it just allows you more flexibility and freedom to do things within the app as opposed to these workarounds like you know still using a google play version but now you have to like you know you can't buy books in it anymore so you got to jump through like a lot of hoops and a lot of people just don't want to do that but this isn't the first time that amazon has done this you know when um they used to sell ebooks through their Kindle app for iOS and something more recently that happened was Kindle for Android. So basically with the Android version, Google Play basically is forcing everyone to use their own Google Play billing platform and any developer that makes more than $1 million a year, which Amazon certainly qualifies for for their Kindle app, they have to pay 30% of each transaction to Google. So for every Kindle book that you buy, whether it's $3.99, $9.99, $19.99, 30% .99, of all those things go to Google. and. So, I mean, you know, ebooks, low profit margin business. So, I mean, Amazon's wouldn't make money for if they had to pay that 30%. And the same thing happened with iOS. Um, you know, for the early days of the uh, iTunes store, the app store, Apple didn't have their own sort of billing system yet. So all app developers had their own internal billing services. And then, you know, roughly about the time that the iPad came out, uh, Apple sort of said, hey, you know, we're going to develop our own billing system. Every in-app transaction has to use like our API and we're going to charge 30% for each in-app transaction. And, you know, this forced all the big ebook retailing apps to flee the platform. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, Kobo, you know, everybody else you know the, both, the only thing that you can do is maybe sign up for a subscription service like um you know buy an audio you know buy an audible subscription service that gives you one credit a month that's the same thing that you can do on android so amazon certainly wasn't the first company on uh, to abandon in-app purchases on android um at the beginning of may audible did the same thing so you can no longer buy audiobooks through the audible app the only thing that you can do is take out a subscription for credits Barnes & Noble fled the platform, so you can't buy audiobooks or ebooks through the Nook e-reading app anymore. And this not only affects people that use the Nook app on their phones, but if you actually have any of the Nook tablets, like the ones made by Lenovo, the ones that Barnes & Noble made themselves, or the Samsung Galaxy Tab for Nook, all those tablets have Google Play on them, which means that the Nook reading app on those tablets can't make purchases through the app anymore which means that you gotta you know buy books on your browser buy books like through the tablets browser and then anything you buy will be sunk to the app and it's just it's a whole rigmarole i mean the whole purpose of people using android was the ease of use that you can buy in-app transactions through the same app and consume media through the app that's not the reality anymore. There's a new reality. It's called consumption. So all the e-reading apps for both Android and iOS are consumption only apps. You can't do any purchases through the apps. It's only consumption. And that really sucks. So let me know what you guys think if you're listening to this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or even on YouTube. Drop a comment below. Visit our website at goodyreader.com and, you know, comment on any of the stories that we have written about. Uh, we have some new information on Send to Kindle and how this applies towards EPUB. So if you guys know... Send a Kindle will be supporting the EPUB format later this year in August. 
So send the Kindle is a there, there's a myriad of things that you can do from send a Kindle for email, send a Kindle for a you know a program that you can download for PCs or Macs. There's a Chrome extension, but basically it allows you to be able to send a Kindle Mobi files, AZW files, you know, files that you download from the internet, say from Project Gutenberg, or if you have your own personal collection of DRM free ebooks, you can just easily send them to your Kindle. It's quick and easy. Not a whole lot of people do that. The, the, the charm of having a Kindle e-reader is that you can do everything within just the Amazon ecosystem. You can download samples, you can buy ebooks, you can download free books. There's a lot of flexibility and freedom there. But some people, especially power users, download a lot of Mobi files from whether pirate sites or um, from royalty free sites. Or if you live in Europe, there's a lot of stores that sell ebooks that only have digital watermarks that don't actually have digital right management. So these like EPUB books will soon be able to be used via send a Kindle. So right now it supports send a Kindle via email. And what is send a Kindle via email? If you log into your Amazon account and you click on under content and devices, you can actually go and check out the Kindles that are registered to your account as well as the apps. And each one has a unique email address. It's usually alphanumeric characters at kindle.com and all you have to do is like copy paste that into your web browser. Um, you know if you're using like Chrome or Outlook.com, uh, Gmail, Yahoo.com, MSN, whatever, right? Um, I use like Outlook for on my PC so all I have to do is like write an email to my Kindle address and then add some ebooks as attachments and then those attachments will be sent to my Kindle. So I've been doing that with EPUB and just testing it right now and it's working. But Amazon said that the other send to Kindle things like the Chrome extension, send to Kindle for PC and Mac, those will work in August. They're tending to like work out some things right now. Um, send to Kindle will also be dropping support for Mobi and AZW books, which are outdated formats. Uh, they don't support modern typography. So let's give a little bit of history lesson. Why is Amazon get rid of Mobi files? from being used for send the Kindles. Well, it's the first format that the Kindle ever support, supported. The company bought MobyPock in 2005 for an undisclosed sum, and they specialized in a new ebook format and ebook reading software, which Amazon eventually used in the Kindle that came out in 2007. And it was used for about three or four years and it's still supported today, um, but there's better formats that were available. In 2011, Amazon developed Kindle Format 8, uh, also known as KF8. It supported a subset of HTML5 and CSS3 features. In August 2005, Amazon unveiled their newest format, Kindle Format 10 or KFX. It supports a new type setting and layout engine that supports hyphen, kernelene, uh, ligatures uh, used for text and for ebooks that support like EPUB 3 and things like that. So KFX is known as uncrackable. When it came out in 2015, hackers have tried and they have yet to break the encryption on there. So any ebooks that are available in Kindle Format 10 or KFX are basically uncrackable, which is why in a lot of pirate sites you'll find older formats that have been cracked a long time ago, such as AZW and Mobi. And those are the two formats that Send a Kindle is suspending support for um, in August. Now, it's important to note that you, you will continue to load in Mobi, PRC, AZW books by using alternative methods by using Windows Explorer. When your Kindle's plugged into your PC, you can just drag and drop um, eBooks into like the folders, but you can also use a program called Caliber and it'll also support the sending of Mobi and AZW books uh, to your Kindle, but it won't support EPUBs. So EPUB is the official standard for digital book formats. It's received major revisions. It basically came out in 2007, and this was known as like the format wars. So when EPUB first came out, 
There was a bunch of other formats. There was Lit uh, that Microsoft did, uh, or maybe it was LRF. Anyways, like Lit, LRF, PDF. There was just like a myriad of different formats that had come out and companies like Sony, companies like Microsoft, they always developed their own format. But eventually EPUB ended up being the format that Everyone started to adopting. It was like the most used publishers used it like big and small. So when publishers like do like ebook conversions, they mainly start at, at EPUB and they ended up like submitting that to Amazon. Amazon converts it from EPUB to another format, which is like the same thing with send a Kindle. When you send a send a Kindle EPUB to your Kindle, it's not like basically sent as an EPUB, it's actually converted to like an AZW format. So Amazon is not supporting EPUB natively in their reading apps. It's basically converting it behind the scenes. So yeah, I mean, EPUB, like everybody uses that except for Amazon, like Apple Books, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Google Books, Scribd, Overdrive, and virtually everybody else. Like EPUB is like the most widely adopted format in the world, which is why I guess Kindle is eventually you know, gonna be supporting this. So that's some sort of good news, but we do actually have some bad news now with Amazon. So if you thought that the Kindle app for Android was bad news, this is bad news if you actually have a Kindle e-reader. Amazon announced that in August 2022, a large number of older Kindle e-readers will no longer be able to access the bookstore. This means you won't be able to buy browse, or even download free samples. Effectively, the store will be inaccessible. This affects the Kindle second generation, Kindle DX, Kindle keyboard, Kindle fourth generation, and Kindle fifth generation. The only way that you could still buy books on these e-readers come August is to buy them on the website, sync them to your Kindle, but you can't actually buy books on a Kindle anymore. Um. Why are they doing this? Well, Amazon hasn't really stated why, but I believe this has to do with TLS certificates. The Amazon bookstore sometimes updates their security and the minimum the store ex currently accepts right now is TLS 1.2. However, in the like, near future, they will be supporting TLS 1.3. Amazon could issue a firmware to solve this issue and upgrade TLS for cold, like older Kindle e-readers, but why bother? You know, there's such a small population of users that actually are using 10 year old Kindles with poor PPI and e ink pearl screens. But the real reason why Amazon won't issue a firmware update because it goes against a new Kindle policy. We broke a story last year, it was around August, that they will only issue security updates for four years when the Kindle was last available for purchase on the Amazon website. This means that prior generation, like the Kindle Basic that came out in 2019, the 10th generation Kindle Paperwhite that came out in 2019, the Kindle Oasis 3, they will only, only be supported from around 2024 to 2026, and then they will no longer receive firmware updates. So Amazon implemented this policy to get people to upgrade every few generations and continue their investment in the Amazon ecosystem. Uh, the hardware business does not really net Amazon any meaningful revenue, but their entire business centers around selling digital content, such as audiobooks, ebooks, comics, subscriptions to Kindle Unlimited, as well as Kids Plus. So, you know, Amazon doesn't make any money upgrading older e-readers to have them access the Kindle bookstore because there's so, so small amount of users that are actually doing that. However, if you're still using those e-readers, Amazon's sending emails out to people that actually have active e-readers attached to their accounts. They're offering them a 30% discount towards the current model as well as $40 in free e-book credit. So if you're still like using this old e-reader, now's the, probably the best time to like upgrade. There's some new e-readers that have come out lately and they're all pretty exciting. 
Um, probably the newest one was announced today, the Pocketbook Era. It's a seven inch e-reader. It's using the new Encarta 1200 e-paper display technology. Um, it basically increases the contrast of the image by 15% and improves the response time of the touchscreen by 20%. So it has a smart light, so both a color temperature system and a front light display. Uh, it's a 300 PPI screen. It has physical page turn buttons, but they have basically redone the design with the era so it's unlike any pocketbook that they've released in the past which always had physical buttons alongside the bottom of the bezel you know they had a home button a more button a back button and so on so they've incorporated that into the touchscreen layer now and they're using carta to make everything that you do on a touchscreen more responsive However, they've still continued to have the physical page turn buttons, but they've slimmed them down. So actually this new pocketbook, it looks very slim and trim. Uh, specs pretty good for a pocketbook. It's a dual core, uh, one gigahertz processor, one gig of RAM, you know, tr traditionally they use about 512, but they're using one gig in this. Um, they have two colors to choose from and each one has a different storage subset. So the Sunset Copper version has 64 gigs of memory. Uh, it retails for about 249 US. And then the default is the Stardust Silver one. And it's basically the whole unit is not like copper or silver. It just has trim along the side. So the whole device isn't it but it, they have like these cool little strips that basically have co color so the stardust silver one is 16 gigs of memory and that retails at about 199 they, these will come out at basically the you know the first week or two of july it has USB C. it has uh, a single speaker as well as bluetooth 5.1 for earbuds, wireless headphones, uh, it has a text-to-speech system, uh, 1700 milliamp battery, and weighs 228 grams, so it's pretty light. And Pocketbook is like one of those companies that support such a wide array of formats. Like, they support literally everything. You could actually, like, load in your own audiobooks too, because it supports, like, so many different formats like one two three four five six seven audiobook formats like 17 plus like ebook formats yeah i mean pocketbook's always been really king at being able to like play nice with people's digital content library of course pocketbook does have an online bookstore where you can use to like buy ebooks from it's not the best but i mean it's a bookstore so i mean there's something going on anyways um other devices, there's been a lot. Uh, the Onyx Book Note Air 2 Plus, a 10.3 inch e-reader running Android 11. It's an e-note. It's basically like an upgraded version of the Note Air 2. Uh, the big differences between the two, larger battery, faster processor, support for magnetic sleep covers, uh, a new color scheme, and the pen magnetically attaches to the side. Um, aside from that, Qualcomm Snapdragon octa-core processor, four gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of internal storage, a giant 37 milliamp battery, Android 11 and Google Play, as well as support for a myriad of formats. Although Pocketbook, you know, obviously supports like the best. But I mean, you know, Google Play on a large 10.3 inch device, black and white display, not color. So if you're looking, if, you know, if you say you have you know, a uh, pocketbook e-note that's more than two or three years old, or maybe four or five years old, this is a good upgrade path because it's like $4.99. However, the pocketbook Note Air, what is on sale for $3.99 right now? So that might be the, the better investment. However, it only supports Android 10, but still has access to Google Play. Barnes & Noble surprised everybody by releasing a brand new e-reader that's going to be available in the first week of June. It'll retail for $119, which is pretty cheap. So this is the same size as the Nook Glowlight 4 that came out in 2021. This is, has the same form factor, so the same shell and everything. This one's called the Nook Glowlight 4e, and it has 
a little less specs. You know, it's using 212 PPI instead of the Nuclei Galoi 4 that has 300 PPI. You know, it's eight gigs of storage, USB-C, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, an anti-glare screen protector, a pretty good processor. It also has physical page turn buttons on both the left and right hand side, as well as a home button on the bottom, the ubiquitous U or upside down, yeah, upside down a U, but it's basically an N. Um, this e-reader will fit all the cases that came out for the Nucleolite 4. So they're not making a new line of cases for this because the Nucleolite 4 e is the same size and dimensions and everything. They're basically using the same device, but they're just using a different screen technology. So they can offer it for like 30 or $40 cheaper than a Nucleolite 4. So this is a good entry level e-reader. Um, why did Barnes & Noble release this? Like, you know, not everybody listening to the show or listening to it on podcast networks or YouTube and, and whatnot, you know, a lot of people are more concerned with like mid-level or flagship e-readers. Because like, if you live in the Western world, you kind of want to buy the best because it's going to like last you for like four or five years. You know, e-reader technology really doesn't dramatically change over time. So, you know, unlike a, like an iPhone or a flagship Android phone, you can hang on to those for maybe a year or two before it's time to upgrade your smartphone with e-readers. The upgrade cycles, like instead of two with a smartphone, it's like four or five. So, Probably the better buy is the Nucleolite 4, but there is a good reason why Barnes & Noble released the 4E. It's mainly so they could have a 4 SKU strategy. An entry-level e-reader, a mid-level e-reader, and a premium e-reader, which is the Nucleolite 7.8 Plus, which has like a 7.8 inch display, 300 PPI. It's the best e-reader that they likely have ever made. Um, just the software on Nook, I think, could do with some love. They've been basically using the same UI and, and system for like five to seven years. So a lot of things change. And I really do think that they need to make things a little bit more responsive. At least from everybody that I've talked to about Nook, they say the weakest part of it is their software. So I think that their hardware is starting to get on point. It's just their software, I think, that needs a little bit of TLC. And I'll bring this up with them. So, why is Barnes & Noble released like basically three readers in like two and a half years? What's up with that? There's a whole new management and that's nothing new. I mean, Barnes & Noble has changed executives like musical chairs. They've changed like five to seven CEOs like in like six years, but Things really changed when they got bought out by Elliott, which is like a hedge fund company. Uh, they actually own Waterstones too, which is the largest book selling chain in the UK. And so they, they own the biggest book selling chain in the UK and they own the largest book selling chain in the US. The same CEO that was in charge of Waterstones that basically churned that bookstore around from Basically, insolvency to being the best, most highest regarded bookstore in the UK was James Don. He's actually the CEO of Barnes & Noble too. So he's actually CEO of two major bookstore chains. So the dude knows books and he knows what it takes to sell books. He's also bullish on digital content. So just to give you guys a sense, like Barnes & Noble in the past, it was really hard for me to talk with executives when it was a publicly traded company and the executives in the nooks would basically stay there for a year or two then they would like move on to like a toy company or you know to the, to the greener pastures barnes noble was just like a resting stop for them there was nobody that was really ever a champion of the nook there, there's been times when it was it looked like it was a priority and then other times it would go like three or four years without a new e-reader and they would do like tablet relationships with Samsung. So it's like they didn't care. But it seems as though like in the last, ever since they got bought out, so basically close to a year and a half now, they've never been more accessible. Like I talked to the VP of Nook I talked to the VP of Nook Audiobooks. I talked to the VP of like e-commerce. Like 
regularly. Whenever there's something I want to know, they're super accessible. And so they've never been more accessible. Before there was all these PR gate guards that you could never talk to executives. You had to like go through the PR like department of, of Barnes and Noble and it would take weeks to get an answer from them. So things have changed. And from all my talks with them, it's like, we really want to make Nook successful and we pay attention to like what everyone's doing in the industry and we just want to make Nook competitive and in the future better. And it's, it was, you know, I guess this sums it up. But three years ago, I talked to the VP of Nook. I asked him if he like paid attention to what Amazon did with the Kindle. He says, no, I don't care. I don't care what Amazon does. Amazon's the biggest company in e-readers. They sell the most e-books. Audible sells the most audiobooks. They sell the most e-readers, the Kindles. You would be stupid not to pay attention to your competition. And then now Bar Barnes and Noble's like, yeah, we pay attention to like everybody. We pay attention to brands that you've never even heard of before. We have those e-readers here that we're testing to see like, you know, if there's anything on them that we could do and we can do better. And I mean, that speaks volumes. Like Nook is back folks. And I think that they're gonna be around for a long time. And there's been times where it looked like that they were not gonna be around. Bionic reading. Have you ever tried this on any e-reader such as the Kindle? This was one of our top stories basically in the last month. So Bionic reading is like a new type of reading. So like, let's just say that the Kindle has a series of world-class fonts that were developed by Amazon. They tend to provide the best reading experience with Bookerly, Ember, Ember Bold, but there's a new font in town that's making its ways throughout the e-reader world. Bionic reading revises text so the most concise parts of the words are highlighted. This guides the eye over the text and the brain remembers previously learned words more quickly. The eye is guided through text by means of typographic highlights. With the interplay of fixation, saccade, opacity, visual stimuli can be transferred to the text which decisively change the typeface. Basically, if you look at Bionic reading is a new method facilitating the reading process by guiding the eyes throughout text with artificial fixation points. The bio in bionic reading is bold. Reading, just the word read is bold. Ah is bold. The first letter of N method facilitating reading. There's the first few characters that are bold. So I guess this like makes the eyes want to read faster, but this is not a speed reading system. Um, it's basically 50% of the content on any given page is shown in bold. Um, they have an API that app developers could use to implement the system in an existing e-reading app, but they actually have an online converter that you can convert EPUBs to a bionic reading format. So let's say that you have, you downloaded the latest James Patterson on a pirate website and you wanna convert that like book and change the typeface so you could like read it on your Kobo or Kindle. What you can do is you could like use the like online converter that bionic reading has. And I believe the link is like api.bionic hyphen reading.com slash convert. So that's API dot bionic hyphen reading.com slash convert. You basically just browse your computer for an EPUB file. Um, it does support other formats such as text, RTF, uh, docx, etc. or enter the text or, or on a website. So you can just like do a body of text just to test. So you can like browse your computer for an EPUB file and it will like automatically convert it to a bionic reading format. And then you can copy it to your Kobo or Nook, or you can send a Kindle via email, the EPUB doc uh, directly to your Kindle. So 
It's a cool new system. And it's been a long time since we've actually had a really kind of cool new ebook format. Um, it's been like, like an e-reading format. It's been a long time, like five or six, seven years longer. I mean, probably Amazon's probably the last ones to make like Ember or Bold or like Bookerly. So the last time I can kind of think that anyone's really made like new fonts that have actually captured the attention of like, or the imagination of people. So <laughs> in the last like month, so many e-readers have come out like, like so many, um, Let's just go over some of them. The Pocketbook Era. The Books Note Air Plus. The Barnes Noble Nucleolite 4E. The Ink Palm Plus Mini. The iFlyTech Air. The iReader Palm Reading Smart 3. What else? The High Reader. The um, Hisense A9. The new Fire 7 tablet, not exactly an e-reader. And these folks were like released just in May. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton of them. Um, the Poke 4, the Poke 4S by Onyx Book. And a few future on it spokes. Uh, Big, Big Me, a Chinese company that started doing English on all their devices. 12 devices. Like, I would probably say that 2022, with the addition of popular devices like the H Huawei MatePad, um, you know, so many big name products that have come out, but, you know, the rest of the year, new Kindles, new Kobos, like new mainstream e-readers they're going to be coming out too i would probably say that 2022 is going to be the year where the most e-readers and the most e-notes that have come out in in history and i thought that 2021 set a record like basically 97 new devices came out last year between e-readers e-notes released in europe north america china and uh, other markets like Russia. So this year, I'd probably say probably 130 devices will probably come out. And I mean, that's never happened before. Not, you know, like all these companies are like doing e-readers. Now, probably say this year about say 130, let's just round up. 15 of them will probably be Chinese only devices with no English, but that leaves like easily 100 more with English that are accessible by everybody listening to the show or watching it on YouTube. So that's, that's huge. What are some of the technologies that these new e-readers are going to employ? So only a paltry few of them this year, like basically counted on one hand have been using Kaleido. So color e-paper there's been like DS slurry devices that were, you know, announced last year that we'll be shipping in this year. Like, um, those crowdfunding campaigns, the names escape me, but we've reviewed them. Let me just look on our website really quickly. DS slurry. They're Chinese companies, but they are releasing products in multiple languages. Yeah. The Reing Stone R1 and a Top Joy Butterfly. So both of these are using like a brand new e-paper technology that only came out in 2021. And those two products are using it. Word has it that more are going to be employing it in 2022. But the big thing about this year is E-Ink Kaleido 3 and E-Ink Gallery 3. So Here's what you need to know about Kaleido 3. It displays 4,096 colors, but it increases the saturation of those colors by 30%. Um, they have a new frontlit display system 
that decreases like the light. So we're gonna finally see uh, color temperature systems with color e-ink. So the last few generations of color e-ink Kaleido used around 4,000 colors at 100 PPI. The PPI has been increased to 150 PPI. And um, they're using RGBW colors on it. Um, it has support for the newest e-ink technologies, e ink Carta 1200, what the pocketbook's using. It's using Carta 1250, which the Fujitsu and the Onyx Book Nova 3 colors are using. On Cell Touch, it supports that. So, I mean, this supports a lot of things that e-ink, like Kaleido 3, is going to be the best copy paper that we've really seen in the Kaleido arena but it supports all of the new waveforms that e-ink has developed. Whereas Gallery 3, it's uncharted waters, mainly because it only affects one screen size uh, right now, which is like about, what was it? Like 7.8, eight, 8 inches. So Gallery 3 is based on advanced color e-paper technology which not only could display 4,000 colors, it could display 50,000 colors. And instead of supporting RGB, it supports like CMYK. So that's how it displays like so many different colors. So Gallery 3, just like Advanced Color E-Paper, suffers from refresh issues. But developers could actually choose what update time they want to have for specific functionality. And this will affect like the color and the amount of colors being displayed on the screen. So it could display up to 50,000 colors. However, you know, the base model could only display 350 milliseconds between page turns or between color states changing. Uh, the fast color mode is 500 milliseconds. The standard color mode is 750 to 1000 milliseconds. And the best colors achieved at 1500 milliseconds. That's like 1.5 seconds. So you'll see the best colors at 1.5 seconds, but that's for the page turn speed. I don't know if a lot of people are gonna be into that, but for drawing, yeah, I could see for drawing like that, although it wouldn't be as fluid, but I think that there's a comfortable medium between 500 milliseconds and 350 milliseconds to be able to display, say like 35,000 colors. Still, that's pretty awesome. So, I mean, it only supports eight inches, like until a few devices come out and people are using it. However, it's not gonna support Carta 1200, 1250 on cell touch. It's not going to support like anything. It's basically a new form of e-paper that is pretty well used to make things look really rich, deep and colorful. E-notes I think could get the most value out of it. So instead of E-notes using Kaleido 3 right now, or Kaleido 2, sorry, um, they usually do about 17 different colors. But I mean, if they use Gallery 3, I mean, they would be able to have like an Adobe style color palette where you could like choose between thousands of colors, like in different shades. I mean, imagine like how far eNotes will move ahead when they could like display as many colors as like an iPad using an Apple Pencil. I mean, it's not gonna display billion colors, but you know what I mean? Like the color, like the color wheel, the fly out color wheel that you could choose on like multi-purpose tablets. That's the same same kind of experience that you're gonna get on eNotes like this year. So I haven't heard about anyone using Gallery 3 yet because like Ink really only showed this out like April of 2022. That's about the same time that they announced Kaleido 3. So. Big E and customers received development kits probably in March. So they, you know, they get enough lead time to say like, do we want to use Gallery 3 for a product that comes out like in, you know, fall? Or do we want to use Kaleido 3? 
Uh, I, have a comp- I have a feeling more companies will do Collider 3 because Collider 3 supports larger screen sizes, 7.8, 10.3, 13.3. 3. So Collider 3, Onyx Books, like Lumi 3, anybody? Wow, that would be awesome. Like, but it also supports smaller screen sizes. So like, prospectively, we could see like Collider 3 smartphones come out, six inch readers, 7.8, eight inch, like the sky's the limit. That's the nice thing about Collider 3 is that the screen can be cut towards any configuration, but this new technology actually supports larger screen sizes than Collider 1 and 2. Collider 1 could only really do like 6.8 max. Collider 2 could do like 7.8 nicely and some companies got away with like 10.3s but like like Big Me was like the only one that really did that so I mean it's you know and, and a, lot, a lot of people have heard about that company but we're really bullish about them like they give tremendous value to like their customers and it's like they release firmware updates they support like a bunch of languages it supports English which is like freaking huge and um, I mean they basically have three types of hardware and they've done sort of like three different models for each piece of hardware. So if you're looking for a good Collider 2, the Carve Color or the B1 Max Plus are probably the best in terms of like octa-core processors, six gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage. I mean, their machines are crazy with hardware specs and the performance on them is like off the charts. So, I mean, they're really gonna give soon. Once they sort of build up some market traction and if, oh, so like, one of the things that always hampered them was like the lack of Google Play. And they just like told us that they're like updating all the e-readers that they released this year, all the e-notes, like basically 12 devices with Google Play. And they're really gonna soon give Onyx Books a run for their money. You know, the companies are both based in China. They both support a wide number of languages. Uh, They both have Google Play, high versions of Android. Onyx probably has more software features and they probably do firmware updates a little bit more regularly. But Big Me's no no slouch either since I've had the car color for about three months, they've done two firmware updates. So they're not as sleeping at the wheel with like fixing bugs, you know, doing what they can with like software enhancements and stuff. So I mean, you know, they, they reminded me of Onyx when they first started doing eNotes, you know. Um, they were probably about a year from seriously competing against Onyx. Like, you know, they were about a year back with like a totally money software experience, but just give them time and, you know, give them your support by buying units and stuff like that. I mean, you can buy them through our, our store at goodyreader.com slash blog slash shop and no hyphen, no slash on shop. Or you can just click on the Goody Reader store on goodyreader.com. And uh, Big Me device is pretty cheap. You can get stuff for like 200 bucks. Uh, price goes up to like a thousand. Depends on like if you want the best specs, flagship quality type things. You know, it's the type of people that are like, you know, when you buy an iPhone, do you buy the iPhone? You know, when you bought, say the 13 generation comes, do you buy the iPhone Pro Max that has like, you know, the most RAM, the most internal storage, you know, the best ProMotion display, or do you get like, you know, a mid-level model, like the Pro, or do you just get the base model? You know, there's, it's, it's like, there's an iPhone for everybody. It's like Apple Watch, you know, like they have like the Apple, uh, Apple Watch with like the, um, you know, the default aluminum display. But did you, did you actually know that they actually make titanium and another metal? Um, so they do aluminum, which is the base, and then uh, the highest model is titanium and stainless steel. So obviously the, the higher the watch caliber that you have, like they're all the same sizes, but just made of different metals. And I think if you get like the titanium or the, 
uh, stainless steel it actually has a better screen, a more durable screen. I noticed with my aluminum Apple Watch, it scratches more easily. But I mean, like, you know, like iPhones, like Apple Watches, like basically like anything that there's like a range of devices. So you can buy like something entry level for just a few hundred bucks. But if you want to get like the Hermes edition, it's like, you know, 5,000, you know, if you want to like pimp it out and like, you know, like make your friends jealous or at least thinking that the more money that you spend makes people jealous, which I don't know is the actual, the real case. Like people always say that like the, the best thing about spending money is so you can flex on people. And that's so evident on like social media networks. Like if you use Instagram, everybody's flexing. Like, look at me, I'm on a private jet, but it's basically a green screen drop like backdrop or like the people that actually have a lot of money like they're rich or their parents are super rich so they're actually on private jets or they rent it for like a day and it's just like they're on a private jet but they're actually not flying anywhere um it, there's like all sorts of different levels of instagram people but everyone's just trying to flex like using you know for me, I never really try to hide who I am. You know, I try to lose weight and, and, and you know, I've started really working out um, the last like four or five months. So I've like, you know, lost like 20 pounds and I feel great. Like, you know, I used to dread like going for walks and exercising and it's like, it's just to become a daily thing for me now. And it's like when people say that like exercise is addictive, it is it like releases like endorphins and stuff. It makes you actually feel pretty good. So I have like I'm smiling more and um, I never used to show teeth when I smile, but I am now a lot. Um, so that's that's cool. Uh, but flexing, I mean, I don't spend money to flex. I spend money like more money on things because they're more durable. Like if you buy fast fashion from like Forever 21 or H&M, like you're buying clothes for like 10 bucks, 15 bucks. If you buy jeans from the like Gap, th those things are not gonna last you for more than like a couple of months before the washing machine puts holes in them. You're not gonna get them dry clean because it's dry clean costs more than you actually paid for the item. So. I've always been the type of guy that spends more on things because intrinsically I want them to like last. So I'll spend like $1,500 Canadian, which is like maybe 1200 or 1100 US on like a blazer because I have blazers that are like 12 years old and they look great. I get them dry cleaned like every five, five or six wears, you know, that mostly, um, co collared dress shirts, maybe like $200, $250 dress shirts. And like my, I have like maybe like 30 in my closet, just different shades. Cause they, they mix and match with like my dress pants and my blazers and my shoes, and my dress shoes and stuff. So I could always like mix and match my fashion. I've had some dress shirts for 14 years. Uh, that I spent 254 and it's like you get so, you know oh, anything over if you can buy clothes that last you like four or five years you're in great like position like you know it's like sweaters you know if you can buy like wool sweaters that like will last you a long time you buy like a good cashmere sweater it'll last you like 15 16 years you know it's like good cookware I recently got like an all cast like cookware set and I got it because everybody was saying in the reviews, that's like, not only is this stuff hella durable, but I've actually passed this down to my daughters. Like, you know, it's like good, good quality cookware will be passed down like generations because it just lasts. It's like, you know, when your parents often will say like, they don't make things like they used to. They cut corners a lot. Like my mom had this toaster oven that she had from like when I was a toddler and she still has it. So it's been like, she's had it literally for like 30 plus years. It's never, nothing's ever gone wrong with it. Not a single thing's ever had to been replaced. It's like durable as hell. And like, I bet she's spent 
100, 100 bucks on it at the time. But it's like, you know, durability is huge. So yeah, when I spend money, I don't spend money to flex. I spend money because like, I'd rather spend more to buy something of quality so you can like get like 10 to 15 years plus of value on it as opposed to like fast fashion, you know, it'd be nice to spend 10, $15 and step hundreds of dollars or a thousand dollars on a blazer. But you know, fast fashion stuff a month, weeks even, you know, that's why those whole stores like change everything so quickly because they could afford to throw everything out that doesn't get sold and change up like the entire stores like selection every two weeks um so you can shop at those stores and your money will go a lot farther but it's basically disposable fashion and i guess the thing about disposable fashion is that the people that actually make the stuff they're the people that suffer because you ever hear like on the news where like people bought something and there's like a help me note like in the, that they find in it like you know i make like five cents like a day and i make like 300 shirts a day like please help you know when when you see things like down in the news it's because of fast fashion it's because like the the little factories in Pakistan or like India or Vietnam or in Africa. It's like they're all underbidding each other. So like hardly anyone's making money, much less the workers to, to make like thousands of shirts and they'll keep on getting jobs because those thousand shirts will get sold, you know, snapped up by for like $5 or $10 a pop all over the US and like a week or two later, they're gonna get another huge order, you know? So that's that's how it is where, you know, for let's look at it from like an e-reading perspective. Um, most e-readers are pretty durable. You know, they're, they're constructed in such a way that you get value. Like I know people that have been using the same Kindle for like 10 years, there's nothing wrong with it. The, the, the thing that will probably go wrong with it if they keep it like another five years, it's just the batteries. Like batteries only have a small number of charge cycles before they go bad. It's usually about 1500 charge cycles that you could do. So for going from zero to full, you can only really do that about 1500 times before you need to replace the battery. But the thing about e-readers is that you could literally read on your Kindle every day and not have to charge it maybe once a month. So, I mean, that's how you can really get years worth of use out of it. And that's the thing that's always appealing towards e-readers. Like whether you buy a Kindle Basic for like $59 on sale or a Kindle Paperwhite 11 generation with a seven, you know, with a seven inch screen for like, you know, $119, you can literally hang on to that for like five to 10 years and still get a ton of enjoyment, save money by buying eBooks and stuff like that. And you get your money's worth and then some, you get a ton of value out of it. But then again, like e-readers certainly aren't disposable. You know, they're the type of thing that you hang on to for like the long term. I've been reading on a, like a first generation paper white since it came out. So like, what, like 2015, 2014, I've been reading on that. So it's like, whatever, like six, six, seven years. I I've never been really too good at math. So hopefully you guys could like correct me or you're not moaning and growing like, oh, what is this guy talking about? Yeah, I've just, I've never been good at math. I'm like a creative guy. I'm less analytical. So yeah, but Hopefully you've enjoyed this edition of the Good Reader Radio Show. Um, you can listen to it on all the major podcast networks. We support like TuneIn, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts. Soon we're going to be uploading these to YouTube to foster some YouTube community because our YouTube uh, channel is doing really well. If you want to check it out, maybe drop a subscribe or just see what we're all about. YouTube.com slash goody reader, all one word. And uh, for all the latest news, previews, reviews, introspectives, commentary, and all the latest news in the e-reader industry. If you want to read the type of news that everyone else like sources as their 
reference when they write e-reader news stories, you want to read us because we're the definitive source and we've been around since like 2008. So like a long time. So we've been tracking this e-reader industry for quite a while. So we see trends analysis, like we, you know, all of the news. So if you want to know about any new e-reader that gets released, no matter where in the world it comes out, South Korea, like China, like Russia, Europe, like, you know, brands from like Bokeen to uh, brands like Fujitsu out of Japan. It's like, you know, we are your online destination. And I've been following this like e-reader industry like more than a lot of people that are actually working in the Kindle division or the Nook division or working at Kobo. You know, it's like I've been tracking an industry like more than a lot of those people that have even had jobs within the e-reader industry. So I know a lot. So if you want to hear more, we're going to be doing these like radio shows like every week. We usually do them on Friday. This is an early edition just because we had so much to cover with like Amazon. So much news coming out of that. Talking about some of the more notable e-readers that have been announced literally in the last three days. And I haven't even talked about like the Onyx book Nova C, which is basically the best color 7.8 e-note that money can buy. Um, you know, I, I've talked about it, I've written a review on it, but I haven't really like mentioned it on a radio show before. So maybe next week I'll give you my thoughts on that. But probably by next week's show, I might have some other interesting news from Onyx Books regarding some new products, but nothing to really get overly excited about. Let's just say that they're more like entry level products.